what's going on here. Let's see what's going on here. Hello, hello. <laughs> so. Boink, there we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of our first person puzzle adventure base game. We're gonna build. I'm Victor, as usual, and let's see what's going on here. Hello, Slipcore. Hello, Irina. And hello, hello, Nick. Um, let's see, the lights are again kind of weird. Just a second, please. Let's fix this bad boy. Video capture device. Something weird. Hello. <gasps> Okay, they're good, they're good, they're good. <laughs> you got two X, hello, yeah. <laughs> Double hellos. Okay, so we're gonna continue with our dynamic light setup. Uh, today, actually, we're gonna focus on fixing those tiny artifacts we kept on having uh, last time. Basically, we're just gonna tweak values here and there. I just reduced the volume a bit on the microphone. I see now it's better. Okay, so um, let's quickly go through the schedule. The schedule. Boom, there we go. Um, we're gonna warm up for 10, 15 minutes. I guess 10 minutes should be okay. Uh, 45 minutes, we're actually gonna fiddle with Unreal Engine. Uh, f making that uh, light as good as we can make it and in 10 minutes we're gonna recap or uh, save some time for Q&A um, if we need to and five minutes will be the usual closing formula so my dearest dearest friends um, let me just start up the project puzzle adventure there we go By the way, can you still hear the background music? Yeah, says Nick. Okay, Nick. Good then. Because I know, uh, I'm guessing you're watching it from mobile again. So I know for you, it's especially tricky when the music goes too loud. Alrighty, Unreal fired up, pitching to the stream scene, boom. PC, ah, and working on the levels, alright, alright, okay, I have to check out the table again after the stream then. Okay, you know what, let's also put in the background here, because it's nice to have the background, bam, there we go. So, um, Irina suggested something, um, and rule number one is I follow her lead when she's uh, suggesting things. Um, for the warm-up, we could actually be playing through what we did so far uh, and look at what still needs to be done, and that's a great idea. So, um, issue number uno, number one. Uh, we have this here, um, I don't know how to call them, splotches maybe. Um, they're probably coming in from the reflection, but they don't look that good, right? I mean, you might call them an artistic effect, but I still rank them somewhere in the artifact uh, neighborhood. Then, another problem. And I hope I won't deafen everyone when shooting. Yeah, it's not that bad. Okay. So, uh, if you look closely at the bottom of the cube, from time to time we are getting some... There, I managed to get it right. Uh, so, when it's moving, we are getting some weird uh, 
colors here and there. I actually tried to knock off some of the cubes from up there. To see maybe we 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 see some dark uh, lines. Ah, there it is. So you see this sharp dark line on the corner of the cube. We're going to talk a bit about this. I have a feeling I know what's causing it. Um, it might be the way the runtime ambient occlusion is generated with those uh, distance field um, inform with that distance field information. So yeah, see you can you can see it sometimes depending on how we sit. We can definitely see a black line on the corner of the cube. And other than that. I don't know if there's anything else we'd need to fix. Maybe, maybe uh, to improve a bit the shadows in the distance, because as you can see, we still get some problems here. When I'm moving away from those buttons, the shadows look a bit eh. Uh, maybe we'll need to fix that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sleep. Uh, I'm actually uh, quite um, happy that I managed to uh, keep it to one hour or one hour and a half. I also feel these ones are a bit more YouTubeable than uh, the long streams. Because uh, on YouTube, I don't know if there are many people willing to watch two hours uh, in a sitting. Okay. Uh, another issue we can clearly see here, and I, yeah, it also shows uh, for you, is you see how we've got this uh, white line on the corner, and then uh, this mech shadowing effect here. It's present basically on all the cubes, on this one as well, on all of them, on this one. Yeah, you can definitely also see it clearly, even though the image is a bit downscaled. Okay, so um, we're 10 minutes in and I guess, I guess we can already uh, start addressing issues one by one. So, the first issue and the one which is the most uh, annoying, if you'd like. The fact that I'm seeing these streaks here. Let's just quickly look at the settings in the skylight. Um, okay, so the occlusion max distance is probably, probably the culprit. Yeah, yeah, so because if I decrease it to 500, it goes away. If I put it back to 1000, it starts happening again. 1500 it gets even uh, more obvious now the thing is uh, I have a feeling that if the objects don't uh, get enough information uh, from their vicinity they start showing this artifact and how do I th how do I suspect this works so right now we are with occlusion at uh, 1500 units right so that means um, 15 meters. So I'm guessing, and I'll try to do a print screen here. There we go. I'm guessing the object search uh, in a 15 meter radius for other objects uh, so they can calculate their occlusion. And when they don't find them or <coughs> ah, excuse me, or uh, find um, uh, too little information, they start basically filling up and inventing their own occlusion solution. Actually, uh, you could see this effect, but only on smaller objects and just in a few parts uh, in Fortnite as well. And since Slipcore is a Fortnite player, uh, actually, I don't want to ruin Fortnite for you, Slipcore, but keep an eye out for this kind of effect. It usually should show up on the facade of the buildings 
and possibly on the ground but not where you have terrain where you have like uh, street um, street tiles road tiles etc so just keep an eye out for this being um, overimposed over the final textures etc being over overlapped over everything now i know i could technically um uh, uh, make it less obvious by working with this um, um, with this slider, the min occlusion, but this generates another issue. If I just bump up the minimum occlusion and basically I make it look acceptable, pretty-ish, check out what's happening with the bottom of the cube. Do you see it? How it, how it has those black laggy black laggy i don't know how to call it there black laggy effects and it's actually easier to demonstrate uh the artifact if i just do this uh, very retro-y but check this out see how see how bad the artifacts are now i mean i'm having this clear black streaks wow check this one out really really yeah way worse way worse so uh just by uh reading the description the description says here uh controls uh the darkest a fully occluded area can get uh but they do say um it does destroy contact shadows and we should not use it so, so we should use contrast or occlusion exponent instead so i'll just put it back because if the folks at Epic say we shouldn't use it, we won't use it. That's the smartest thing we can do. And we're going to try to address this one by just decreasing the occlusion max distance to 500. And it's gone. Let's, let's push it at a 600. Still good. Okay. So it's almost fixed. Almost fixed. This might still be from this uh, max distance. Let's try it again at 500. There. Now it's uh, ameliorated for this one as well. Let's just look around the scene. So this look okay, but they still have other issues. We'll, we'll get into that. Uh, this looks good. I'm not seeing much. I'm not seeing much uh, dark streaks here. Make a tool and tell people not to use it. Good job, Epic. Uh, yes and no, Nick. Yes and no. I'm pretty sure that if we go into some hardcore, uh, hardcore uh, light settings, we might actually benefit from uh, ramping up the minimum occlusion. But for the default case and what we're trying to achieve, like making sure we still are in the bounds and the parameters of the engine i think we're good now uh there's another thing i'd like to do and that is in the occlusion tint to actually bring down the alpha so to make it i don't know uh, 0 0.5 so when when i set it to be um, when i set it to have occlusion to still have some alpha into it like the full fullest occlusion still has some alpha maybe this actually Let's, let's actually try it, but if it doesn't work, we'll uh, roll back immediately. Maybe this will, will, will allow us to ra ramp up the... Yeah, okay. There we go. This seems to allow us to uh, tamper with the minimum occlusion as well. Seems. 0 0.65, let's say. And now if I turn around... Ah... I'm still getting the artifact here, and I guess you can also see it here, the dark, dark streak. Yeah, yeah. I try lowering the alpha to, I don't know, zero. Nope, nope. So I'll just keep the alpha to 0 0.5. Uh, I'll again set this maybe to 0 0.1. Maybe it gives us better results. I still see the black line. I don't know how obvious it is for you folks, but yeah, there it is. 
We still have the, the black line here. So no, I'll just I'll just revert this to zero. Let's keep it as Epic recommends. Okay. Uh, now uh, I'd like to make super sure we still have good occlusion in the distance and for that I found a sweet spot where I can test it so I can just stay here and look at these boxes right uh, and let's try to actually make the contrast a bit more powerful in the occlusion I don't know 0 0.5 seems to be a good a good value and the exponent uh, I, I do want them to be contrasty. Hello, Butchik Pro. Welcome, welcome, my dear friend. We are uh, slowly but steadily winning over all those artifacts that were uh, giving us trouble last time. So let's try to go to a 1.3 in the occlusion exponent, like this. And now I'll just zoom towards them. I'll just fly towards them to make sure I'm not getting too much artifacting. And it seems to be okay. I am getting some occlusion. It looks good. Okay. Now let me show you a trick. We have this post-process volume, which is set already to infinite extent, unbound. Yeah, so basically the post-process volume I placed uh, in the map covers infinitely the map. So it doesn't pertain only to the bounding box of the post-process volume, right? So I can, uh, I don't know, even decrease it like so. But it still affects the entire map. And uh, I'm pretty sure that in its details in the ambient occlusion Gregor's man you just subscribed my friend thank you very much you made it to the founders list first of all and secondly thank you for uh, supporting uh, the the channel wow you're super nice thank you so much friend welcome uh, you will have to choose a nickname so you could access the um, so you could access the SVN. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's see. I do want these to be more contrasty, so I can uh, work with the ambient occlusion intensity and radius right and I could either increase or decrease the radius let's see if it actually works yeah okay so I can definitely see a bit of movement I don't know how well you can see it I'll try to find a better angle where it's more obvious I am seeing something here so look here in the bottom corner of the box you know what I just ramp up the intensity a lot because this way we'll see it here in the bottom corner of the box and here right uh, not necessarily color correction work uh, Gregor's man but more like uh, making sure we don't have artifacts after switching to a fully dynamic uh, lighting setup for our uh, game so we're just tweaking everything to make sure uh, we don't have artifacts anymore Let's try to make it, I don't know, something like this. You know what, I'll just put it at 150 with intensity 1. There we go. Okay, so it looks good. Let's look again under the cube, under the hood. This also looks good. Okay, 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 okay. Now, we still have this issue. So you can see the cube has actually close to two issues if I, if I, look, if I look at it uh, more closely. So we still have, I'll actually try to print screen it for you. We still have this edges 
here all of them yeah which are more lit than the than the part that gets some shadow and uh, if we actually look closer to it can you see this this tiny black line here I don't know how well it shows up for you in the in the stream but I'll try to green screen it somehow so I'm getting this and just to make sure I'll try to upload the image as well this one okay um, so with all of this we are getting some um, how should I call it I don't think these are because of the settings but I think these are more because of the geometry we use and one way to prove my theory is if we actually look at if we actually look at the mesh distance fields from the visualize menu and here I think you can easily see what's going on although the cubes are sharp on the edges exactly Gregor's man well spotted so remember the distance field meshes are a simplified three-dimensional texture that kinda kinda looks like the model so basically what's happening and I'll try to draw over this somehow is this is the distance field simplified 3d texture uh, used to calculate the ambient occlusion at runtime and this is our cube right our cube will always be sharp on the edge and actually going out of the simplified uh, version of the mesh so of course of course i would be getting something like uh, this i would be getting this uh, tiny little aberrations here on the on the corners not everywhere it depends on how they get calculated but we do get them right so here's something i'd exactly exactly uh and it probably thinks it's uh, sitting on the outside and probably generating some aberrations here and there so that's why i will actually uh, duplicate this object and replace it with the chamfered cube the default chamfered cube from uh, unreal super simple right uh, let's also make sure we're using the same white material because it's super easy to to spot so i'll just quickly navigate to the material by pressing find in content browser selecting the other object and then using the material i navigated to okay so now uh, let's also make super sure we open the chamfered cube sorry it went in another monitor for some reason uh, and let's make super sure we actually generate the distance field for it yeah so it's at 1.1 resolution it's not too sided and it is used because we did generate the mesh distance field and to confirm this always check let me try to grab a print screen always check in the top left corner that you actually do have uh, information about the size of the distance field so well, there you go okay uh, so I've done this here and it looks good and just just look at this beautiful AO I'll move this cube the one that's selected but please look at what's happening on this face of the cube that's uh, standing still real-time dynamic uh, solution right look at this beauty look at this beauty 
look at this beauty i mean it's i i just love the mesh distance fields and what they they allow us to do just look at it amazing amazing see how it darkens the surface it's getting yeah yeah it's really cool and fortunately enough it's decently uh, priced in terms of performance so we're not getting a huge performance hit fully real time yeah and let me just demonstrate this further we can actually I, ah okay this is stationary but this is movable we can actually see how it it gets generated see we have it here it's so beautiful and it, it works with all the pieces of geometry in the scene, all of them. So now it's doing it here to a lesser extent. It's of course doing it uh, for the ground. It's, it's lovely. Anyway, see how it's darkening this corner now. Let's try to push the cube eh, just a bit closer see how it's darkening now even more of the corner perfect uh, is it possible to use a mix between baked and non-baked uh, asks uh, Gregor's man I guess but um, I also guess it would get a bit more expensive than we'd want it to now I don't know why one of the lights is in preview here and it's weird because I'm on stationary. Ah, okay. It just woke up at some point. Okay. Uh, it would be possible, but uh, I don't guess it would make sense from a performance standpoint. Now, uh, let's try to change in our uh, test uh, constructed object. Which should open okay let's try to change the geometry there uh yeah no no real benefit in terms of performance and i think you'd actually eat up more uh vram because you'd have to store the light maps as well as the um distance field information there are some hybrid solutions which apply some dynamic solutions with distance fields for uh, a few objects in the scene while the rest of the scene is calculated statically but if we went uh, re um, real-time dynamic we'll try to you to solve all our problems uh, while keeping this real-time dynamic solution all right oh so uh, these need to be chamfered as well right this happen this should be very easy we'll just use the one meter cube chamfer when we generate the mesh i'll compile it i still don't like the material because i we're using the gray one and it's pretty hard on a gray material to see the gray um, to see the gray ambient occlusion but you know what let's let's uh, let's go a bit into debug mode i didn't i'm i'm not going crazy i i'm not going insane let's do this though so i'll select the skylight again and uh, i'll set the actual color of the occlusion tint to something really wacky like red but this way we can see all easily we can easily see all the places where we are applying the ambient occlusion not bad eh? we're not gonna keep it like this we're not gonna make a mentally red game but it's super easy super easy to work with it uh, yeah yeah it's like uh, we're in the factory in uh, Terminator 2 right <laughs> in the foundry um, Occlusion contrast, exponent. I, I'll just try to uh, play a bit with the contrast values so you can see exactly what's happening uh, when we're pulling this slider. So everything is hot indeed. Uh, as I am increasing the contrast value, uh, it's actually keeping the occlusion where in the parts 
closest to another object and dropping it from the rest, if you'd like, from the rest of the object. And I, I see, uh, at least for uh, Cold Hot Fuel battling a uh, slight amount of blue-red. Okay, okay, let's, let's try something like that. So I'll just put it to 0 0.85, which gives me a good, good occlusion. And as Cold Hot Fuel, a slight amount of blue-red. Slight amount of blue-red, well, maybe I can add it in here. So I could uh, add in the base, uh, in the base skylight, something like this. Completely whack. You know what? I'll go for, I'll go for something green, <laughs> blue or red. Yeah, yeah. Uh, blue. Maybe we can see it with blue. Yeah. Okay. We can see it with blue. There we go. There we go with blue. Uh, the good part is, not only now do we have this cool effect, but we can also see where the direct color f coming from the uh, skylight influences our objects versus where the ambient occlusion kicks in. So remember, the ambient occlusion is with red and the direct light color is with blue. Uh, something else we can do here. Uh, um, Epic talks about this trick, if we remove this lower hemisphere is solid color flag, then we're basically getting um, a free skylight bounce like effect. Now, the, the only problem I have with this, with this technique is that it does tend to make the, the skylight way too powerful now, right? So I'll try instead to use the lower hemisphere as a solid color, but just make it, I don't know, something like turbo green to see to see where where and if it kicks in. Okay, so judging by what I can see now, I guess I'm getting some direct blue and I think we can see it best here, right? So I'm getting, and I'll actually use the, the colors we used. So we are getting direct blue from the top part. We are getting uh, green as if it's coming from the bottom. And everywhere where the objects overlap, and I don't need to draw this, it looks like we're getting the red, the ambient occlusion. We don't need to save this. It, it's, it's lit from all angles. Yeah. Uh, so, I still don't know if we should use it or not. I'll just turn the light color back to white again. Just to see how powerful the bounce is. So if I go into blue, okay. The bounces are pretty powerful. Okay, you know what? Let's just reset the light color now and reset the lower hemisphere as well and try to disable it. See, it's really powerful. If we disable it, we'll just keep it and let's make it like turbo green. Ah, too much. The problem with the lower hemisphere is that it was intended to be black. So everything I put which isn't uh, black makes it really powerful and obvious uh, the more I go further from uh, black values. Maybe if I, ah, yes, I can control the alpha. Perfect. Just perfect. So maybe if I go with a 0 0.5 in alpha, I'm still getting some tinting here and there. Eh, for now we'll just keep it in black. Another thing we can do is instead of using the SLS captured scene, where we actually capture the scene with the, uh, the light in order to determine the color, I could use a specified cube map. But for now, I won't, I won't go into that. I won't use a cube map, I'll just use the captured scene as it is. 
Uh, remember, we can recapture the scene using, using the button here, boink. If stuff changes dramatically in the scene, it's a good idea to do it. And now let's solve our last problem, because I think we solved most of our problems, but let's solve this one. I still don't like what's happening on the sides of the cubes. You can see how we have, it seems we have something going on here. This is actually their shadow. Okay, I will be the first one to admit that the uh, angle at which the light comes over the cubes is totally silly. It's very sharp, so of course they're a bit confused about how to generate their own uh, shadow. Let's try moving the light first. So I'll just select the light source and if I'm not mistaken, just by rotating it, there we go we're obtaining uh, different effects, right? The shadows are lengthening, uh, the ambient occlusion, of course, is changing, so it looks good. Uh, okay, okay, okay. However, I will revert this, right? And let's try to actually fix this anyway. Maybe in our game we will want the light to come directly from the top. I'm I'm not so sure of it. I'm actually pre pretty sure we don't, we won't want that, but let's try to fix it anyway. So what I'll do on the light source is I'll try to investigate um, either the cascaded shadow maps and the way they're built, or let's see if I have something else. Nope, I don't have any other uh, settings, so it's definitely the cascaded shadow maps. And I have here a value that says distribution exponent. Let's just try wiggling with the... Aha, okay. So this one controls, let's see what it does. Controls whether the cascades are distributed closer to the camera, larger exponent, or further from the camera, smaller exponent. Let's try to go on one. And this already improved a lot, a lot my self-shadowing. I still see some self-shadowing, but now if you can notice it, it starts slowly on this part and it's not that obvious and it's not that powerful. Powerful. Let's actually also try to uh, make them more intense. Because this brings them sharper and higher i'll just try to drop them somewhere here but i also try to make them more punchy and for punchiness punchiness if that's a word uh i guess the mean roughness is the number to try to change i guess i'm seeing some some changes but not enough to make a difference uh, modulated shadow color, maybe, if we, ah, but I, I'm not using modulated shadows, my bad. Resolution scale. This is getting, this is doing something to the quality of them, to the crispness of them. Shadow bias. Whoa, okay. Nice. Uh, the problem with the shadow bias is, um... The shadow bias is a, is a value which is uh, which impacts performance a lot. So they say here at that zero, uh, the shadows cast uh, the shadows start at the caster surface. But you see how much aberrations we have. At one, uh, they look the bestest and start the bestest. So let me just put them. Uh, shadows will start further from their caster and there won't be self-shadowing artifacts but objects might appear to fly around uh, so 0 0.5 seems to be the good value let's push it just a bit more to 0 0.6 like this and now the self-shadowing looks decent enough I mean I still see its self-shadows look on this cube, on the white cube, it's obvious. I still see the self-shadowing, but it's not 
looking like it's a cutout. So I'll just go back to, to the previous setting and reset it. See how sharp it looks here and you kind of, your brain goes like, ah, why is there a, a, a cube in a cube or what's going on there, right? Whereas if we undo it again, much, much smoother. So let's keep it at 1.8. There we go. Now, there is a single uh, bug left. I actually saw it when I was uh, moving around the scene and uh, showing uh, you folks stuff around the scene. And that's actually quite an interesting one, which we won't be able to fix. There it is. So please examine what's happening and I'll go full screen for this one. Please examine what's happening here. And I'll just circle with green this part and even this part, right? Try to, try to make a mental snapshot of what's going on in these uh, areas, right? I will just upload the picture so we can keep it for reference as well, right? Okay, there we go. So we have the reference as well. And please notice what's, what will happen when I'll start getting closer to the object. I'll do it uh, deliber deliberately while moving pretty slow so we can actually see the proper one kicking in. Slowly, slowly, boom. You see how this one looks much cleaner? So this is uh, Slipcore because of multiple of two reasons and both of them are entirely entirely my fault and I'll I'll, I'll take credit for this uh, mistake so this is not something we'll be able to fix with the current setup we have so the problem goes like this um, I'll try to draw it somehow to explain it like this uh, very, very good attempt Slipcore, but unfortunately no. <laughs> it, it's not about the alignment, it's about the way I'm trying to use the distance field shadows and why it's not working. So let me just draw a bit. Uh, what's going on? So when we had our camera somewhere here, because right... Uh, here is where we started and where we first stopped to look at the artifact. We had the camera here. What we're actually seeing is on a distance from the camera, we're actually seeing each object using his own, uh, its own distance field shadow mesh, right? So I'll just put it here, distance field uh, shadow Shadow per object, I'll call it, per object. So we're actually loading that low resolution representation of the 3D texture, uh, the distance field, and we're calculating based on that. However, from a certain distance further, we are using, uh, I don't know the exact term, but I'll just call it a global... Uh, we'll check exactly how it's called uh, immediately after I finish the uh, print screen. A global distance field. Distance field. And I'll actually try to save this one as well. So it's like a, it's like a loaded version, if you'd like, uh, of the distance field uh, shadow meshes. And that's why we get the loaded result. It's like a lower level of the day. You can see it, oh man, here you can see it kicking in clearly. So it's not so good looking. You can see it here, 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 right? And now, boom, proper looking. Not good looking, proper. So this is the, 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 the sweet spot, the distance at which the transition happens. And I've actually tried to show first the mesh distance fields, right? There they are. So these aren't the ones used. And then I think we can uh, see it with the... 
ah, global distance field. So I use the proper, um, the proper term. That's why slip core, because you can actually see if you're looking real closely, this looks mucky and that's, that's why we're getting those aberrations. Uh, Buchik Pro, we are on uh, 419.2, but I'm, I'm pretty sure most of what I'm talking about here is available even in 418, in one form or another. Okay, maybe they did update it recently, but you should find pretty much the same functionality in uh, older versions as well. Um, I mean, this is something they introduced in 4... 13-ish or even earlier than that. Um, don't quote, don't quote me on that. <laughs> okay. So my problem is uh, I'm trying to force a system to work uh, the way I want it, not the way it's supposed to work. Uh, yeah, from source. So everything I'm doing here is from uh, source, Buchik Pro. Uh, the only things you'll have to do is to go to the project settings and I'll just grab you a print screen for this and for everyone else uh, in the stream and interested about this. The only thing you'll have to do is go to rendering and let me try to sum up all the check marks uh, in a single uh, print screen. So you will just have to do the following. In uh, rendering I'll just try it. Oops, I'll try it with red because it shows out better and try to do a box. There we go. So in rendering, you will have to uh, uncheck allow stat static lighting. So you don't use the static lighting solutions anymore. You would have to generate the mesh distance fields. And I would also recommend generate the landscape real-time GI data because I'm also using uh, the landscape and you're almost set. Uh, also, you would need to convert both your skylight and your uh, um, uh, directional light from the scene to fully movable lights and you are set. <laughs> the red. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you very much. Getting ideas? <laughs> Okay, um, so the problem is I'm trying to use this system uh, and I think I can actually open up Photoshop so we can look at what I wrote uh, in the last episode in Photoshop uh, and what I really have to start considering because that's why I wrote it here in the do's and don'ts as well, right? Mm -hmm. Check this out, folks. Uh, I don't know with what color to, to do it or not. I'll do it with uh, red, actually. Boom. We can't have large meshes. Uh, one, because per individual mesh, uh, so even when looking from up close, you can only imagine that a large mesh, even when looking up close in the per mesh distance field, will still not get enough detail. And because on the distance, distance, di distance, distance field, is that what it's called? Let's, let's check it again. In the global distance field. Okay. Uh, in the global distance field, each object gets assigned a very tiny texture. So basically, uh, Epic's, e Epic thought about the architecture like this. They said, for the global distance field, we'll have a fixed size texture with a pre-allocated size and all the objects in it will receive a tiny part of it. I guess that's how it works, don't take my word for it. Um, however, that's why we can't have large objects, because a large object will get the same um, global distance field resolution as this tiny yellow one. It would look good on the objects which are in lava, yeah. Yes, yes, yes it would, yes it would. 
Nick. Yes, it would. I totally agree with that. Um, okay, so that's about it uh, in terms of fixing it. I, I now believe we have a, a, a good enough solution. There's only one thing I would still like to do. I would like to uh, revert the red color because we're not going to use uh, the red color in the skylight. We were just using it as a debug and I will try to bring it back to our classical black. Maybe, just maybe, we'll go a bit into the blue hue, just, just so we can see where it is. There we go. We're now a bit into the blue hue. Whoa, we're a bit too much into the blue hue. This is completely unnatural. Just, I, I, just a, few, a few steps into the blue, not much. Okay, and there we go. Now we have our distance fields properly set up. We don't have much artifacting. Uh, if you're wondering why we still have these splotches here, I'm guessing it has to do with the resolution. I'll try to quickly address this. So let's try bumping this up to two. Boink. And let's see how it looks like. Nope, it still looks a bit uh, weird. So I don't need to waste all that memory, 0.1 megabytes when it's set to uh, 2 in its distance field resolution versus 0.02 megabytes. So uh, again, Slipcore, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're the programmer, uh, the programming uh, brain. I do have a feeling the increase in uh, distance field resolution is... Um, Cubic, which kind of makes sense because we're talking about the three-dimensional texture. So I do feel we're going into the cubic increments. So doubling here doesn't mean doubling the memory consumed. It means uh, multiplying by the power of three the memory consumed. Uh, that's why we have these steep increases in memory used every time we try to bump up the resolution. So if it's not from there, it will probably be from the post-process because of the intensity or radius of the ambient occlusion. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, so it is a bit from... It might be from here, but it's not. Okay. Then it might be just because of the distance. I don't know even if I should tamper with it anymore because I kind of like the solution. Let's try just rotating an object here. So rotate without any nap. See what's going on. So it's not that bad. I'm guessing just my rotations were a bit funky. And you know what? I'll keep it just the way it is. I do also have some global reflection, a bit, a bit of metallicness on the objects. So I guess they're also picking up something from the reflection side of things. But I'll keep it just like that. Oh, I know. If anything, if anything, we'll go to the skylight and maybe uh, decrease the exponent. Yeah, because that's what was uh, making it super black. I don't know, let's keep it at 0 0.8. Okay, so we won't have that annoying black anymore. Of course, unless it's right in the back, super heavily ambient occluded. And that's that. RG Doggy. Uh, RG Doggy, uh, I guess I could, but uh, as NGS Nick uh, said, it's not my primary goal right now. Now I have the following issue, uh, and this is actually a longer discussion about the ambient occlusion and how we're gonna tune it. I tuned it so it looks good here, where we have a lot of objects clustered together, but now I'm kind of losing it here. It's not that punchy and powerful, right? Because here I'd like it to be more, uh, a, a bit stronger. So I don't know exactly how I'll fix this, other than using different 
Um, I should tell Epic about these problems. Yeah, uh, they're not necessarily problems, Nick, because I can s solve this by using uh, different post process uh, volumes because I'm pretty sure I can control this in the post process as well. Distance field ambient occlusion, occlusion exponent, post process volume. Let's see if I get it here. Uh, I should also have it here. There we go. Unfortunately, it doesn't work because I would need to enable the light propagation volume. And this is something I won't do. The light propagation volume turns everything even further into a real-time GI uh, scene. But I won't do this now. Uh, because we're getting close to the end of the stream. I will do, however, one more thing. Uh, this is a really cool trick I've seen yesterday in uh, one of Epic's uh, uh, talks from a gaming conference. I don't know exactly if it was a GDC or something else, but here's a trick they use heavily. And once you discover this, folks, you'll, you'll never go back. So remember how we studied how many dynamic lights we can have, um, not movable, but stationary, which is the trade-off between a fully movable dynamic light and a static one. Um, and we now know we can't overlap all, all of them because at some point they would start uh, disabling themselves. So if I add just one more on top, boink, I just, I just disabled one of them, right? So we can't overlap them, of course, uh, but we can still use them to achieve impressive effects and um, they're really cool because um, they can still update their colors in uh, real time. So I can hook up a script uh, in my level blueprint and make them um, play with their intensity and their colors and that would uh, be updated real time so that's really cool however once i once i've seen this trick yesterday i'm i'm hooked i mean i'll never do things any other way so for all the point lights for all of them uh let me just select all of them first I will do the following setting and this is amazing folks this is I don't know I don't know under which rock I have lived for the past years I don't know when this showed up but it, it is the best optimization solution ever max draw distance and max distance fade range in uh, the performance tab so let's just say uh, we want to draw these lights uh, at maximum I know 2000 units away from the camera, right? So now I take the camera away and you can see them being switched off, right? So they're not computed anymore. So not computing one, two, three, four, five, six uh, dynamic lights is a huge imp uh, improvement. It's a huge performance boost, right? However, you see them pop. So you're like, what uh, did something like a switch, did a switch enable there? So that's why we'll use the fade range. And let's say the fade range will start from uh, 1300 uh, centimeters. So check this beauty out. See how we're getting a slow fade? And it's, I'm telling you, once I discovered this yesterday, I, I'm trying to spread the word about it because it's amazing. You're getting this uh l easy transition into the um, lit situation and being uh, possible to do per light um, you could still keep a dominant light with a larger radius that gives you the color punch and uh, just tweak the smaller ones so for instance now let's do it uh, properly if you will so for instance we can keep this one with a larger radius, so we'll uh, we'll actually let's call this one our uh, dominant area light, right? So this will be the the light 
that defines the mood and the gameplay mood from this area. And I will also increase its uh, distance, uh, its attenuation radius, I will increase it a lot, like so. And let's give it a color. Let's give it a red color. Yeah, make it red. Uh, let's also make it super intense, so we actually see what's going on there. Let's also increase its source radius quite a lot, like this, and I'll show you why in a minute. And let's make it uh, cast um, ray cast shadows that also use those distance fields. So ray trace distance field shadows. That's a huge word. There we go. And for just for this light, I will keep it uh, on um, all the time. Boink and boink, right? So this light acts like the beacon in my level, in my world. This signals to me there is some reddish gameplay going on there, whatever that might be. Uh, slaughterhouse, loot, you name it, right? However, uh, once I get closer to the scene, I can now tweak all these baby lights of it. The baby lights. I just call them baby lights. Because <laughs> they're smaller. <laughs> right, I'll also make them red. And I'm not losing the, the importance of the scene here, so I'm not losing the fact that the player needs to know dude, there's a red area there, you probably should stay away or you should probably watch yourself. See, it's a red area, so something bad's about to happen here. I still get the visual cue from the distance, but by calculating only a single uh, dynamic light at runtime, and as I get closer, Closer meaning also controlling the area better, better altogether. And we'll talk about this more in the level design course about the first person puzzle adventure. Because when you get into an area, as a level designer, you can control uh, the amount of geometry and what you're showing and hiding from the rest of the world. Right? And now I'm getting all the important detail I need. And I do my gameplay here, I fight some monsters, I pick up some loot, and then at some point, maybe it's time for the hero to leave that area. So he leaves the area, and voila, the other lights are already starting to fade. Now they're completely cut off, but I still remember, yeah, there where that red light is, we had an awesome fight. Uh, follow the lights, yeah. Uh, the three main uh, pillars, if you'd like. The, um, the bread and butter of level design is um, uh, lights, loot and landmarks. So that's what I believe level designers should focus on their entire, most of their uh, time working uh, with uh, any kind of engine. Putting the lights right, putting the loot right and putting the landmarks right. And Gregor's man is asking me if I'm fixing lights in terms of an FPS game. Uh, I'm Yes, yes. So I'm definitely looking at it from the perspective of the first person. It won't be an FPS, I mean a first person shooter. It will be a first person puzzle adventure, but I just didn't uh, remove yet the rifle from the player's hands. Uh, big studios have people for lighting. Yes, but uh, again, uh, I'm not expecting a level designer to... Actually, I'm expecting a senior level designer to do lights properly. I'm not expecting a level, a junior level designer, for instance, to do lights uh, and to do this kind of tweaks and balancing and whatnot. However, I am expecting any, any level designer to be able to think of his own uh, light signaling, uh, how he wants to use the red lights, how, what does turning uh, light from green to red would mean for the player, uh, occluding lights, working with shadows, etc. Now, uh, there is something else I want to check 
just to make sure I did it right. So I did ask this light to cast shadows and to use the ray trace distance shadows. And I just want to make sure it does that. It does look like it does that, but I just want to make super extra mega sure. <laughs> so I will for now just kill the shadows on the light source. Okay. And I will just want to make sure this one is casting the ray trace it is it is but they're really really uh really uh soft source radius I'm increasing the soft source radius as well to i don't know 300 eh. no effect uh let's also let's try to make it rougher do i have a roughness uh, parameter <laughs> even you have me yeah fair enough because the cool effect we could get when uh, doing uh, ray traced shadows although they are expensive <laughs> is this so we we are getting uh this kind of um soft shadows but i just want to make sure um let me cast it from something you know what i'll just grab this rotate it about 90 degrees we don't even have to be accurate bring it all the way here ah there we go see how because of this light was casting uh, soft shadows. Just look at this beaut. I know the shadow itself is very, very faded. I don't think you can even see it. So I, I'll try to maybe bump its intensity up, up even more. Animation. What if I decrease the source? No. Um, Jenko, they have environment artists as well. The important thing is validating gameplay first. Yes. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Yep. One of those expensive superstar uh, artists. <laughs> okay, let's reduce the intensity of the skylight. Not entirely. There we go. Check out this beautiful soft shadow. Actually, I can move this maybe closer to the light. Look at this beauty. Look at this beauty. So I'm getting now a super soft shadow. A super soft shadow. See how it softens as it goes further away from the light? This is beautiful. Uh, but this is expensive, folks. Look, look at this. And I don't know why I'm still getting the preview material here. Probably because the statics need to be, the stationaries might need to get baked. Let's try turning it to movable, fully movable. Now this works, that's for sure. Static, movable. It might still need to bake, I'll have to check that. But even if I set it to movable, I'm still not uh, killing the FPS that much. And again, the, the beauty of soft shadows, of those expensive soft shadows. Let's try rotating a bit. See how I'm never getting sharp edges? I'm just getting versions of softer shadows. So let's put it, let's take it even further. And let's move this a bit further as well. Just look at it. Beautiful. Okay, now I'm getting uh, jitter uh, from the corner, but this I think can be um, can be fixed by this: the ray start offset depth scale. 
because this should control the offset. Ah, no, it controls it only on the object, not on the project, on the shadow projected to other objects as well. Okay, okay. This is something to investigate in our time. Uh, now, the problem with this is being so expensive, I wouldn't use it on the main light because it's affecting so many objects. I mean, even these objects are casting a super soft shadow on the ground. You know what? Let's also add this cube material to the landscape. So we get rid of the checker. Boink. There we go. We can see now the soft shadow even coming from these cubes. And again, looks amazing. It's lovely. Just look at this beaut and how the soft shadows get crisper as the object gets uh, further away and softer as the um, shadow has to basically lengthen. I mean, it's amazing. I love it. But it's also expensive. Again, I don't know why I'm getting the preview in the stationery. That's uh, something we'll have to document in the next episode. Mm, and let's turn off the soft shadows. You see how sharp they are now? Ain't that something? Okay. Okay. Done. Saved. Not. I'll actually play it a bit. Yeah, I'm still getting the preview here. I think I know why. There might still be a setting that needs to be done in the project before we close the stream. Project settings. And of course, for all the subscribers, um, for the first 25 uh, tier 1 subscribers and for the tier 2 and 3 subscribers, um, you will get access to the SVN. Uh, if you don't choose a name uh, and send it to me via private message or in our Discord, by the way, let me link you to the Discord again. Um, I will just use your um, Twitch uh, nickname uh, so I can give you access uh, to our uh, SVN so you can make a get latest and just get the latest modifications I did to the project. But one which I want to do now before uh, closing the stream would also be um, uh, there's something about the shadows where we can um, where we can pre-bake the dynamic lights and only update them when the objects or the scene changes. Uh, dynamic... Very movable point lights, no. Uh, calc... Pre-something. I don't know if it's in the rendering or in the direct X uh, settings. All settings, shadows. Um, we built. No, we. Uh, bake. Yeah, anyway, I can't find them right now. I have to dig in and remember and remind myself what the option is. So, uh, sharp shadows, which are cheaper still. Uh, they still look good enough. Okay, much more obvious now. But remember, everything in here is still dynamic and beautiful. I'm still getting this preview material. I have to investigate exactly why. I don't necessarily like it. Come on, get over there. Look at this. Beautiful, just beautiful. Oh, I forgot to bump up again the skylights to their default values. 
That's why we have the blackness here. There we go. Now with skylight and the light source should be good. Oh, I know why. Because this object I, is set to movable. Hmm. Are you set to movable? Now you are. Okay, this is something we'll do in our next episode. Then we'll have to understand why we still have this preview uh, showing up here when we are uh, set into a fully dynamic lighting scenario. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, just for the fun of it, let's build everything. Of course, the preview now uh, went away. And I want to see if I have generated... I didn't generate any light maps. Okay, so we just need to build it. Yes. Because the stationary lights uh, actually get their position information saved, if I'm not mistaken. That's why the build fixed it. All right. All righty then. Um, that should be about it for today. We now have this beautiful, this almost beautiful AO. <laughs> almost beautiful AO. <laughs> um, in our next episode, we will start creating some tinier versions of objects. Uh, I guess the biggest object size we'll have will be, I don't know, 5 meters by 5 meters. And we'll just plug everything in and start replacing all the large objects we have in the world. So we can uh, have properly generated um, global uh, distance field ambient occlusion as well. But at least today's progress was that for anything that's close to the camera, we have beautiful, real-time, dynamic ambient occlusion which is just amazing so let me just save this here and let's transition to our closing theme there we go um any questions folks Yeah, and we are like 20 minutes overboard. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm still working on sticking to ex precisely one hour. But if there aren't any questions, I look forward to seeing you again on... Which one is it? This one. I look forward to seeing you again on Monday, 9 p.m. Central Eastern European time, 12 p.m. Pacific daytime. Hello, Roberto. <laughs> bad timing bro bad timing uh, <laughs> so um, Roberto no sweat we'll meet again on uh, Monday 9 p.m. Central Eastern European time 12 p.m. Pacific Day time I also have to make the announcement now announcement uh, Monday will be a lazy Monday so we will uh, play um, for sure, we have already Nick, uh, who submitted his uh, prison uh, level made in Unreal. We're gonna play through it a bit. Um, and if anyone else, Slipcore, uh, Jenko, uh, anyone else, uh, Virgo Pros, Mini Rebel 3, I don't know. <laughs> if anyone else wants to send me work in progress builds, the rule is uh, let's try to uh, have them at least tested to see if they open up on my machine until uh, Monday afternoon Central Eastern European time. So just uh, send them over until, I don't know, Sunday evening. This way we still have some time to ping pong a bit to, to make sure. Slipcore, yes, you are in a vacation. No pressure, my friend. I might have a secret trick up my sleeve. I might have a secret trick up my sleeve and if uh, only uh, Nick is the one that's submitting work in progress builds I might just uh, try um, to launch the original Gears of War for PC 
I don't know if it will work maybe in compatibility mode. Uh, we can play uh, a map I did for that, where I did both level design, environment, uh, dress ups, and lighting, and cinematics, everything. And um, without having uh, Nick completely lose his mind, we might actually open the messiest level blueprint I have ever created in my life. But again, let me test this and I'll update you folks on Twitter or on Discord uh, because um, I don't know if uh, it will start being such an old, uh, old uh, version. And the remastered version, uh, as far as I've read over the internet, doesn't have the editor included. And even if it does, I'm not sure it ports one to one and works. So let's stay updated. Thank you everyone for watching. See you again Monday 9 p.m. Central Eastern European Time, 12 p.m. Pacific Daytime on our Lazy Monday. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye everyone. See ya.